The Iron Lady, with a steely resolve, Britain's first female Prime Minister who was famously not for turning. Margaret Thatcher has died at the age of 87, a towering figure in post-war British and world politics. This is Inside Story, looking at the Thatcher legacy. We have lost a great leader, a great Prime Minister and a great Britain. British Prime Minister David Cameron has been leading tributes to Margaret Thatcher, who died following a stroke. The shopkeeper's daughter dominated British politics for more than a decade, leading her Conservative Party to three election victories. She won praise for rescuing Britain from economic ruin. She tamed the trade unions at home and Argentina in the Falklands War and helped thaw the Cold War. But critics branded her as a heartless tyrant who ushered in an era of greed at the expense of the poor. Alan Fisher looks back at her life. In recent years, she was rarely seen in public. Health problems dictated she take a much lower profile. Arguably the most recognisable British politician since Churchill, Margaret Hilda Thatcher became Prime Minister in 1979, the first woman ever to be elected to the position in the UK. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith. And where there is despair, may we bring hope. She promised economic changes, but progress of what was dubbed Thatcherism was slow. Under pressure to alter course, famously, she refused. The ladies not for turning. Then Argentina invaded the British-held Falkland Islands in April 1982. After a short, bloody war, the islands were recaptured. The white flag is flying over Stanley. Yay! So the way she fought that war, the decisiveness, seemed to work as a sort of metaphor for what she could do for the economy at home. She'd beaten the Argentines in the South Atlantic, now she's going to beat unemployment and the economy things at home. Dubbed the Iron Lady by the Russians in the general election the following year, well, Mrs. the Falklands factor saw Mrs Thatcher's Conservative Party win with a much bigger parliamentary majority. But her new government found itself challenged by a strike by Britain's coal miners. It was a violent, bitter dispute which split the country. It is the miners' strike in the mid-80s, which I think began to define her then, and with the passage of time will define her completely as the divisive figure that she was. It did seem as if one half of Britain was taking up arms against another half of Britain. She would say that it was a necessary battle. Strikers showed their defiance. It was a battle she eventually won. <laughs> Mrs Thatcher had long been a target for the Irish Republican Army. In October 1984, a hotel she was staying in was bombed by the IRA. It was a clear attempt to kill her and her cabinet. My husband was in bed and all the windows went and the bathroom was extremely badly damaged. In your own room? Yes. In your room? Yes. I we think were, that's enough for yes. we, were, we were very lucky. On the international stage, she wooed and bullied in equal measure. She described Mikhail Gorbachev, the then Soviet leader, as a man she could do business with. But it was with Ronald Reagan, her political soulmate, that she developed a special bond. She was on the phone to him and she was going on and on and on. And he was in a group with uh, advisors around him and he picked up the telephone as she squealed so that everybody could hear, held it out to his friend. Nya, 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 they could hear. And he turned to his friends and said, isn't she wonderful? She attracted fury for consistently refusing to impose sanctions on apartheid South Africa. Some think she's been harshly judged. She was no friend of apartheid at all. She was telling uh, South Africans the whole time that this cannot last. Not so much on moral grounds, but on, on sort of economic grounds. This is no way to run an economy. You cannot do this. You have, you have got to change. She won a third term as Prime Minister, but controversial policies lost her support in the country and in her party. In November 1990, she resigned and left Downing Street. The Iron Lady almost cracked. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years. Politically, Margaret Thatcher cast a shadow which remained after she left office. Her final years were dogged by ill health. A series of minor strokes meant she rarely spoke in public. But critics and supporters alike would accept 
that Margaret Thatcher helped create a period of fundamental change, not just in Britain, but across the world. Let's meet our guests today. In our London studios, British Member of Parliament Jeremy Corbyn. He belongs to the opposition Labour Party and is a vocal anti-war campaigner. Also in our London Broadcast Centre is Ian Dunt, editor of politics.co.uk. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today. Now, Ian, if I could start with you, I want to quote something that you uh, said in one of your articles just recently. For Thatcher, there is much to genuinely admire, but her overall impact was negative and disastrous for the character of Great Britain. Very strong words there. Could you expand a little bit more? Whatever happens whenever you're talking about Thatcher, you always end up using very strong words. And I think for people on the left, the first half of that sentence will be considered strong as well. Um, nevertheless, Thatcher turned us into a colder, meaner country, a tougher country. Her worst moment by far came when she called striking miners, the trade union members who she was taking on, the enemy within. This was an unspeakable thing for a British Prime Minister to say of her own citizens, and it's something which it is almost impossible to forgive her for. And Jeremy, would you agree, too, that she turned Britain into a coldless, heartless country? She was an incredibly determined politician, a conviction politician who probably believed in pretty well everything that she did. She had about her a belief that somehow or other the welfare state wasn't really for her. She didn't really believe in the National Health Service and she created a society that was based on money above all else. It was the worship of money and that became made Britain into, yes, a much colder, much more heartless place at the end of her term as Prime Minister. And though many of those changes, unfortunately, have stayed. Well, let's talk about her impact in today's politics and today's policies as well. Right now, uh, Ian, how, how would you see that her, econom her economic reforms back then, um, she said, was very much needed? Now, they were slow, they were painful, but she was unyielding. How do you think those policies have now impacted on today's economic uh, situation in Britain? Almost everything that is happening to us now derives from what Thatcher did from 79 onwards. If you actually look, the defeat of the trade unions resulted in a suppression of low and middle incomes, which triggered a consumer credit boom, which triggered a need for more welfare for people who were at work but not being paid appropriately in order to sustain a consumer economy. And those two factors played a very major role in the creation of the financial crisis. So some of the stuff that goes back to Thatcherism, to Reaganomics, has an effect today in creating the economic situation in which we're in. Some would say though, that is the fault yeah. of the governments, the successive governments that came after her, though. Why didn't they respond faster? Why didn't they respond well, in a I more effective more. manner? I, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, it's every government that has come after Thatcher has accepted her basic principles, her assumptions of economics and of politics. Even Tony Blair, I mean, Tony Blair, by the way, is her greatest creation. He, he represents the pacification of the left. Tony Blair came in and really didn't question fundamentally Thatcherite economics. He may have wanted to alter the proceeds of growth slightly, what you do with the money that you get from it. But the actual economic situation he inherited from the Tories, he didn't challenge at all. So really, every government that has come after her has accepted her economic principles. Jeremy, I can see you nodding to that as well. You would agree that Thatcherism is, uh, turned out to be a negative uh, issue for today's Britain. When she became Prime Minister, Britain was going through a period of enormous industrial change because there hadn't been enough investment, particularly in manufacturing industry. We hadn't embraced enough of new technology and um, about half of the gross national product came from publicly owned industries which were improving. She went on a binge of deindustrialization and privatization which created a false boom, then deregulated the City of London and turned us into a financial services economy rather than a manufacturing economy. And as Ian has quite rightly said, successive governments didn't really challenge the basis of what Thatcher was about. And uh, her idea was that you picked on various enemies at various times. And so she didn't start with the miners. She started with privatization and a weird thing called popular capitalism, which ended up with uh, some of her colleagues being 
prosecuted for insider dealing on shares and things like that. And then in her second term, after the 83 election, after the F Falklands War, she then took on the miners, and the miners' strike was unbelievably bitter dispute and calling miners the enemy within, imprisonment of miners, and that strike went on for over a year and uh, the devastation of the coal field communities is still there. What were proud, strong working class communities reduced to unemployment, poverty and drug dealing as a result of her policies. Well, no doubt the tributes are pouring in and British Prime Minister David Cameron has paid his own tribute to Margaret Thatcher. Let's uh, pause here and hear what he had to say. Today is obviously a day we should most of all think of her family. We've lost someone great in public life, but they've lost a much-loved mother and grandmother, and we should think of them today. She served her country so well, and she saved our country, and that she showed immense courage in doing so. And people will be learning about what she did and her achievements in decades, probably centuries to come. That's her legacy, but today we must also think of her family. Ian, very strong words there. Again, she saved the country. Uh, she Actually, she defined a very different Britain. Do you think if she was a politician today, she would be just as successful? That's a very interesting question, um, and it's quite a difficult one to answer. Certainly, her major difference is that this was a time of actual conviction politics, of people who fiercely believed in what they were saying and were arguing for fundamentally different views of the world. You look at politicians today and it's difficult not to come to the conclusion that they are shadows of that period where these political giants really strode the earth. I think she would have struggled in, in the days of focus groups that we're obsessed with right now. And Jeremy, would you agree that we would need a stronger politician? Do you think perhaps Thatcher would be just as popular today? Thatcher was greatly underestimated when she became Tory party leader in the mid-1970s, but she shouldn't have been because she showed a lot of bottle in taking on Ted Heath, who was the leader, defeating him, becoming leader of the opposition. And the Labour Party disastrously misjudged her at that time. She was patronised quite a lot by the then Labour Prime Minister, James Callaghan. She was not seen as being a credible alternative. It was only much later on they recognised that she had an idea ideological strain to her that was very strong. It was probably stronger, in my view, in completely the wrong direction, but stronger than that that was, uh, was being offered by the leadership of the Labour Party. And uh, I think uh, she then became Prime Minister, and obviously the rest, as they say, is history. Would she be successful now? Probably not, because I don't think that kind of strident, um, dictatorial tone, didactic approach that she took to everything would really work. Now she and others have sometimes cr claimed that uh, Tony Blair is their greatest creation. Tony Blair inherited a lot of what she had done, particularly the structure of government and the heavy centralization of government around the Prime Minister's office and that has remained to the detriment of the whole system of government and parliamentary democracy in Britain. Ian, how do you think she's changed, or has she at all changed the, you know, we talked about Tony Blair, but has she at all changed the Conservative Party in any way? Yes, I mean, the Conservative Party is obsessed with her as a sort of spiritual leader, and, and that goes really for all parts of it, the more moderate wing, which frankly grows smaller every day, and the sort of hardcore right-wing um, backbenchers who hold her up as a, an almost Christ-like figure. That shouldn't, you know, blind us to the way in which she got ri uh, they got rid of her, um, which was pretty mercenary, pretty severe. And actually from which something very interesting came, because it was the way that the Tory party got rid of its leader, it seemed to give it almost an addiction to this harsh attitude towards any kind of failure at a leadership level. And they, they've approached, you know, the, their future leaders in almost identical ways, getting rid of them at the drop of a hat in an extremely mercenary way. I just want to pause our discussion here and perhaps get a little bit more now from our correspondent, Paul Brennan, just outside of Downing Street, the traditional London home of the British Prime Minister. Let's hear what he has to say. The health of Mrs Thatcher had been declining for some years, so the announcement of her death really didn't come as a huge surprise uh, to the political establishment here in the UK. But the statements have been coming thick and fast since the announcement of her death was made. Uh, the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, has now issued a more fulsome statement than initially released. He's now said, today is a truly sad day for our country. We have lost a great Prime Minister, a great leader and a great Britain. He said, as our first woman Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, 
Thatcher succeeded against all the odds. And the real thing about Margaret Thatcher is that she didn't just lead our country, she saved our country. Now, the funeral arrangements are already being made. It will be a ceremonial funeral with military honours as opposed to a state funeral. That's simply etiquette. Really, state funerals are preserved for kings and queens, frankly. Even Her Majesty the Queen Mother didn't get a state funeral. But those watching when the funeral takes place will see very little difference between what would have happened under a state funeral and what will happen under the ceremonial funeral. Uh, it will take place at a date yet to be announced, but it will take place at St Paul's Cathedral here in the centre of London. That, at the request of Lady Thatcher herself, she expressed a strong preference for the funeral to take place at St Paul's, and it will be followed by a private cremation. Her legacy, of course, will be bitterly divisive and bitterly debated. To some people, she was uh, a hate figure, there's no doubt about it. To the industrialists and to the unions, uh, they despised her. Those people who support a free market economy, uh, there will be deep mourning. Uh, I mean, her, her economic reforms actually uh, got its own phrase, Thatcherism. And it's left an indelible imprint on the political life of the UK as well. Even subsequent Labour Prime Ministers, Tony Blair in particular, uh, moved his party closer to the centre, away from the, the left wing that the Labour Party had previously occupied, into the centre. And many people saw him as a sort of disciple of Thatcher, despite the, uh, the, the unpalatability of actually saying that out loud. Now, Tony Blair himself has issued uh, a statement today, and we'll have I can give it to you now. He said that uh, very few leaders get to change not only the political landscape of their country, but also of the world. Margaret was such a leader. Her global impact was vast, and some of the changes she made in Britain were, in certain respects at least, retained by the 1997 Labour government. So not fulsome praise, but certainly a doff of the cap by Tony Blair, a Labour Prime Minister, don't forget, to his predecessor, Margaret Thatcher of the Conservatives. As I say, the funeral arrangements yet to be finalised, but they will take place in the coming week. This is Paul Brennan for Inside Story in Downing Street. Now, no matter what you think of Margaret Thatcher, part of her legacy really was to the victory in uh, the Falklands War. Jeremy, I want to ask you, this was a war that really sealed her image as the Iron Lady. Was it a necessary war? Well, she was deeply unpopular at the time that Argentina occupied South Georgia and the South Sandwich Islands. She took military advice, which initially was that uh, they couldn't do anything about it. And uh, the whole Foreign Office approach was one of uh, diplomacy and negotiation, which she then rejected and said, we will launch a task force and we will go there and we will defeat the Argentinians. She consistently rejected any overtures for peace, though that being organized by President Terry, Brandia Terry of uh, Peru at the time and by the United Nations and went ahead with it. What later transpired was that she got a great deal of um, covert support from General Pinochet in Chile, which she later rewarded with arms sales to Pinochet. Yes, it did change things and certainly the 83 election was like a sort of um, jingoistic victory rally for Thatcher uh, over the whole Falklands experience. She knew how to tap into a narrative of imperial grandeur and use it to devastating effect in British politics. But again, the Labour Party leadership at that time supported her on the Falklands and those of uh, us that criticised or questioned it were very much in, in a minority at that time. But ultimately, as everybody knows, there's going to have to be some kind of discussion and some kind of uh, agreement of some sort with Argentina over the use of um, port facilities or something else. She knew that as well at the time, but she saw the politics as more important than the long-term interests. I want to stay now with um, Thatcher's foreign policies as well. And uh, Ian, you have to give her credit for bringing the Soviet Union out of the Cold War and wooing Gorbachev uh, onto the international stage. She did have some role in that, and she did recognize how useful Gorbachev could be as a moderate influence in the Soviet Union. I actually think probably her role in that is slightly overstated. I do think in foreign relations, the Falklands War is much more important. I would also take a less critical stance than Ms. Corbyn has taken there. I actually think that was an incredibly impressive moment for a British Prime Minister who stood up really for the principles of self-determination. 
and did so against American advice. This is important to remember. I mean, the Americans were lobbying very hard for Britain to be uh, more moderate in its stance, and this ent entirely unprovoked uh, war of aggression from an Argentinian junta. And she actually stood up to Washington in that respect, something which we can't imagine Tony Blair or any of her successors really having the guts, having the gumption to do. Um, so that, I think, was her prouder moment. The Soviet Union stuff, yes, it's significant, but I think her role in it is somewhat overblown. She also had a very close relationship with Ronald Reagan as well, didn't she, Ian? How do you think that uh, impacted her term uh, in office? Yeah, they were very close indeed. It is a remarkable moment when you have two people who think quite so similarly um, in power at the same time. Uh, you could imagine similar things happening. You know, it's counterfactual history. If Tony Blair and um, Barack Obama had been in power at the same time, the history would be very different. Certainly in that situation, you had two people who looked at the world in an almost identical way, and they seemed to have a very close personal chemistry. Um, and it provided one of those, what's considered a high point of the special relationship. Jeremy, her life was also in danger when the IRA targeted her. Now, that also showed that she was a very strong leader. Surely you can give her credit for uh, dealing in a strong, determined manner when it came to the IRA. Well, she later on then did uh, have some degree of discussions with uh, the Republic of Ireland, with the SDLP, Social Democratic Labour Party in Northern Ireland, and ultimately there was an um, Anglo-Irish Accord. One could argue that that actually paved the way for the later ceasefires under John Major, and then finally the um, Easter Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, that came much later under the Labour government. As she was very determined for most of her time to seek a military solution in Northern Ireland, even though one was obviously completely impossible and simply not going to happen. And remember that there were gross miscarriages of justice carried out during that period, Birmingham 6 and Guildford 4, for example, where the Prevention of Terrorism Act was used in the case of the Guildford ones to imprison people who were later proven to be innocent. Um, did she learn from all this? Probably yes, but she was very much um, influenced by the death of Airy Neve, and that did uh, affect very much her relationship on the whole issue of Northern Ireland. Although later on, maybe, certainly Major, I don't know if she ever did, realised that there was never going to be any military victory in Ireland. There had to be a political solution, and that's what was sought, and that was what was finally found. I'd like to pause the discussion here and uh, get to our Facebook reaction. We're getting plenty of reaction, in fact, uh, on Facebook, both tributes and criticism. John Blythe says she dismantled the education system and made things harder for the British people. Jared Owitty goes on to say, declaring ANC a terrorist organization that would never rule South Africa, as if she had a say in that in the first place. And Richard Thorne writes, a developing economy, she tripled unemployment, devastated communities across the country and ripped out the majority of British industry. But Malcolm Sillis says in an age when she was needed, she came to centre stage and did her job and she did it well. She rescued Britain and the Falklands. I admire her gumption. Rest in peace. And Mercy Manganjo adds, I was quite young when she was PM, but I remember admiring her strength and courage in a society where women were still afraid of getting dirty. She has been the woman I am now. Ian, that's quite a positive thing to say about Margaret Thatcher. She indeed was quite an icon to a lot of women, particularly women uh, in politics of that time. Was she a feminist? She was not a feminist. Uh, she was a feminist icon, though. And even some feminists object to her being called a feminist icon. The thing is, internationally, she was such a strong, such a powerful image that she sort of communicated the fact that women could play just as tough as men, could take on men and beat them at their own game. However, she herself despised feminism. She did absolutely nothing to elevate other women into positions of power. Um, and she exhibited that thing that you sometimes get from sort of ethnic minorities and women, where, where because they've succeeded, they actually uh, more critical of, of people who are similar to them for not having succeeded to the same level. So it's quite a complicated relationship that she has with her gender. But I think broadly, the effect of it, the influence of it, was very positive indeed.
I'm afraid we're going to have to leave our discussion there. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for uh, discussing the legacy of Margaret Thatcher. Thank you to both our guests, British Member of Parliament Jeremy Corbyn and political analyst Ian Dunt. And thank you, too, for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, please email your thoughts to insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks again for watching. Goodbye for now.